Okay, so I think we can start. Thank you for being here. And this is part of the series of the Resiliency New Age of Risk. But what I'm going to show to you today and the next uh, week will be about optimization. So the first uh, lecture today is the basics of what is optimization. And then we will apply that to a test case next time. So this is the outline for today. We have an introduction, then we will discuss what is mathematical programming, that is the branch of optimization that we are dealing with. Uh, the basic use of Ampol. Ampol is a language, a programming language that we can use to model optimization problems. So to describe an optimization problem that is a mathematical model into a language that the computer can understand. And then we will, we will discuss one of such problems, a quite famous one that is called the max flow problem. Uh, before moving on, any of you has any experience with optimization? No. Something? Okay. Okay, so about this course, I think you know this. Um, for the next time, if you have not done so, I will ask you to install Ampol and Cplex. So Ampol, as I said, is the language to model the problems, and then Cplex is the solver that we use to solve the problem. Um, I think you should have some instruction. If not, I will show you later in the slide the web page where you can download this. And there should be a free license that we can use for this course. Uh, as I say, the first lecture is the basics and the and the methodology and the theory, if you want. And then the second one, we have some practice. So it will be a little more interactive. If you need any anything, this is my mail. Feel free to contact me and I will try to help you as much as I can. So what are the objectives of this course? First, we want to learn what is mathematical programming and we will focus on integer and linear programming. So we will not touch other topics like non-linear, non-convex, no. We just look at linear and integer. We will learn how we can take a problem described by words and translate that into a model that we can implement with Ampol and then solve it with Cplex. Then we will learn the concept of worst case scenario and robust optimization. And then we will apply this knowledge to the max flow problem that will be introduced at the end of this lecture. So let's start with mathematical programming. What is mathematical programming? So mathematical programming is a subfield of optimization where the focus is to find the best solution, the optimal solution for a problem. And these solutions that we can consider as uh, uh, like when we are looking for the best, we can consider a set of these solutions. They are called feasible. And these feasible solutions are determined by constraints. So you can imagine there are constraints telling you what you can or cannot do in a way. And out of all the possible choices that respect this constraint, we want to find the best one according to a performance measure that we call objective function. And to characterize every solution, we use variables. So these are the main ingredients of a mathematical programming problem. The constraints, the variables, the objective function. And then, of course, there is uh, another component that I didn't mention here that is called parameters sometimes or data, so the numbers. Now, um, something that I want to highlight in other fields like architecture, parameters means variables. That's why I use the term data to be clear, because for us in optimization, parameters means data. Okay, just in case you hear parameters in other field, uh, make sure to know that it may not refer to the data, but rather to the variables. Some examples of optimization problems are, for example, the shortest path. If you are driving, maybe you are familiar when you drive from uh, one point A to point B, and maybe you use your navigator and then you find the shortest path. This is an optimization problem, the shortest path problem. Uh, you may have other examples, for example, in uh, architecture, in civil engineering, in finance, uh, there is the uh, risk minimization portfolio, right? So you have an expected return and you want to minimize the, the risk. And then there is a max flow later. 
So as I said, it will be at the end of the lecture. So what is the procedure that we need to follow when we want to model and solve an optimization problem under the mathematical programming um, category? The first thing is we need to understand the problem. So usually the problem is described in words and, and then we need to be able to formalize this problem. Really first is understanding what is the problem and formalizing that. And how we do that is through an abstract mathematical programming model. So you can imagine that as a set of uh, rules that we have to use to define, for example, the objective, the constraints, the variables, and so on. So later I show you examples of that. So when we understood the real problem and we have the mathematical model, let's say on the paper, we need to write the model in a language that the computer understands. And that's why we use Ample. And then we have to solve the problem. So finding the best solution according to the objective function. And for that, we need a solver. Finally, we need to interpret the solution into the real world. Why? Because many times the models that we develop are abstract. It's very hard to create a one-to-one -one representation of a problem because it can be very complex. So usually we may need to do some kind of approximations and abstractions. And uh, this means that the solution we find sometimes may need to be interpreted to, be, to make sense in the real world. In this course, we focus on the second and third point. So how to create a mathematical model of the problem and how to solve the problem. If you have any question at any point, feel free to stop. Now, I say that we need to solve the problem when we have the model. And again, to create the model, we use Ample in this course. Ample means a mathematical language problem. Uh, sorry, a mathematical programming language uh, is, um, is not the only one. Uh, there are other software you can use, for example, GAMS, or there are even packages for Python. But this one is the one I choose because it's really focusing on the modeling and not on many other things like in Python, the variable types, and no. Here is just for modeling. And then we need to solve the problem. Depending on the type of problem, we have different solvers. So for integer problem, we may need to use one solver for nonlinear, another one. In this course, as we focus on linear and integer problem, we use the solver Cplex that is one of the best available. And, and then, as I said, we use Ample for uh, modeling. Now, the nice thing here is that we don't care how to solve the problem. That's the nice thing about optimization. In this context, when we have the model, then we know that there is a software to solve that. We don't need to find a strategy, for example, to know what is the shortest path from A to B. When we have the model, we know that we give that as input to a solver like Cplex and we have the solution. So the focus is not on solving the problem, but rather on modeling the problem. This is the basic mathematical programming model structure. So in this case, we want to minimize a function f of x. f of x is what we call objective function. We can also maximize. Usually people write mean, but mean or max is the same for us. We can minimize or maximize depending on the problem. Then we have some constraints. We may have inequality constraints like g of x less than or uh, or greater than uh, zero, or we have equality constraints. Um, one thing I want to mention here, you usually don't find in optimization strict inequalities. So you may not see like g of x strictly less than zero. Why? Because these make the problem harder to solve and the, the theoretical challenge is the following. Let's say that I ask you, what is the max of X when X is less than 10? Then it will be like 9.99999 and you can go as close as you want to 10, but you cannot say 10 because it's a strict inequality. And this can create some numerical trouble. So usually in optimization, we have no strict inequality. 
if we want to represent a strict inequality, we can put an epsilon, right? But uh, th this is the reason why usually you don't see strict inequality in optimization, okay? And then X is the vector of variables. So this model represents the following problem. What is the best solution usually indicated by X star? When you see star means optimal. That respect all the constraints, so g of x less than or equal to zero and h of x equal to zero, and that produce the minimum value of the function f. This is the model, and this is the problem that the models want to solve. So when we have this model and this described in Ample, we take the model, we give this to a solver like Cplex, and then we can find x star. So this is more or less the procedure. Now, as I say, there are different types of mathematical programming problems. So we have linear, when all these functions, f, g, or h are linear functions. We can have integer or mixed integer when, when some of the variables can only take integer values. We have nonlinear programming when at least one of these functions is nonlinear. Maybe you have products, maybe you have a square or so on. And then the, let's say the more general category is called mixed integer nonlinear programming. So you may have a mix of nonlinear stuff and integer variables. Uh, there are also other categories. There is convex programming, black box, robust, stochastic, and so on. But we focus mainly on linear and integer programming in this course. So this kind of model, yes? Can I ask you what would be an example of a variable where that, that's uh, um, integer? Uh, a lot of uh, examples may come from choices. Uh, integer could be zero, one or so. Yes, no. You want to model choices. I can or cannot do something, right? This is an example. Or sometimes uh, it may be because for, for the nature of the problem, maybe you, you can only sell Imagine you have a problem where the variable is the amount of, uh, uh, I don't know, the amount of dishes that a restaurant sell, and it cannot be fractional, it's only integer, right? So in some applications, it makes sense to have integer variables. Binary, as I said, is a subcategory that is quite relevant for modeling choices, uh, but these are just a couple of examples that I think are relevant. Okay, thank you so much. No problem. Solvers, uh, I think we say that already, but for linear and mixed integer linear programming, we use Cplex. That's all. It's just the name of the software we can download from the website later I show you, and that's all. OK, you have seen the general form of the mathematical programming problem, but what is the linear problem? If we focus on linear, can we simplify that? Yes, and usually this is the kind of model that you have. So you see that the function now is not f of x, but is the c transpose x. Sorry. Where c, you can think about c as a vector of uh, data, numbers. So for example, you may have 2 times x1 plus 3 times x2, and 2, 1 will be, maybe I can write this easier. Let's see if I can. Um, so if you have, for example, these, right? So you can write these, imagine that this is this. C will be the vector two, three, right? And X will be the vector X one, X two. Okay, so this notation is to make the model more compact. And this AX equal to B, imagine A as a matrix and B as a vector. So this is a set of equalities, basically. Right, so a matrix could be, I don't know, two, one, three, five, right? This could be your A. And then multiply times again, X1, X2. And then you have, I don't know, three, five. So what does it mean? This means 2 times x1 plus 1 x2 equal to 3. 
and 3x1 plus 5x2 equal to 5. So this is a compact way to represent a, a, a set of equalities. It can also be inequalities. As we say, we can be general here, but they cannot be strict. So this is just a notation that you may see when you when you work with uh, uh, linear programming. A mixed integer linear programming is basically the same, but you see that here we have some variables that we call x, i, that are integer. These means integer, uh, belong to the set uh, whatever z, I don't know how they call it, the pure mathematician, but this is the set of the integer variables, okay? So basically, out of all the variables x, some of them are integer and some more of them are not. So this is the main difference in terms of uh, integer programming. I want to say something here. Actually, I want to ask you something here. We say that integer programming, variables can only take discrete numbers, right? It can, instead of being like 1 to 10, any number like 3.5, whatever, it can only be 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, up to 10, right? Which problem do you think is easier to solve, linear or integer? Yes. Um, well, like you mentioned that for the, the constraints, it's difficult if you can get close. Well, I th I would say maybe linear because then any value could be the solution. This but is what the intuition will say. Unfortunately, is wrong. And I explain you why. Actually, they belong to two different classes of complexity. If you're familiar with complexity theory, linear programming is in P, integer is, is MP. So I show you why, just quickly. Um, we say that a set of constraints represent your feasible region, right? So imagine you have two variables. Sorry, I write very bad, but... So imagine that linear constraints can be these and these and these. And imagine that the area here, inside here, is your feasible region. So all the points here are possible solutions. And then you are saying, well, if this is a linear problem, any solution inside this region can be optimal, right? But if it's integer, imagine that this is one and two and three, and this is one, two, three, then only these points, maybe I change color, uh, let's say red, only these points can be solutions, right? Maybe these and this, correct? So you may think there are less, uh, Solutions, therefore, is easier to solve. The reason why it's not is because you can prove in linear programming that the optimal solution is in one of the vertices of your region. It cannot be inside. I don't want to go through the proof of that, but basically, because the solution is always on the vertices, this is something that will give you a, an advantage eventually over going through a procedure where any point inside can be a solution, any integer point. I don't know if this makes sense, but knowing that the solution is only on the vertices, on the intersection of constraints, means that actually you have a procedure to solve the problem where you can explore these vertices. And then you have conditions where you can stop at some point and you know that this will be the best and you cannot improve rather than the methodology to solve integer problems where you need somehow to go through these uh, integer solutions and you need other ways to uh, rule out what cannot be optimal. But these other ways are not as efficient as those where you need just to explore the vertices. Okay. Let's talk about uh, Ample. So Ample, as I said, means a mathematical programming language and is a very interesting language because it's quite close to how you would write the problem on the paper. 
there are some uh, um, keywords that we need to learn with Ample. We need to also learn what is the way to represent the sets, the parameters, the variable objective, all the ingredients that we discussed earlier. Uh, there are also some nice way to make uh, long expressions quite compact. And if you want to learn more about Ample, there is also a book for free uh, where you have all the information, the details and so on. So when we want to represent a problem with Ample, we need three, usually three components. We need a mod file. This is the model where we have the objective, the variable constraints and so on. We may have a data file dot dot where we have the parameters, so the numbers, the data. Why, why is optional? Because sometimes people write the numbers directly in the mod file. That is perfectly fine. But if later you want to change the data, it's maybe easier to keep the number in another file so you don't touch the model anymore. But you can do both. And then a run file. The run file is where we have the um, instructions like this is the model, this is the data, use this solver, solve the problem, print the solution this way, and so on. So again, these are the three components, the mod file with the model, the data file, and the run file with the instruction to run. So let's start with uh, an example file. Imagine here we have uh, two variables, x1 and x2, and these variables are greater than or equal to zero. So in the mod file, the way we want to write this variable is like that. We use the keyword var, name of the variable, bound, and we always have to end with this. Okay, remember every command, every time we specify something need to end this way. Otherwise, the, the ample will not understand that we are, we are done with that. So this is how we declare variables. Uh, to declare parameters, we use the keyword param. So A in this case is a number with value three. Okay, we can give a default value in the mod file, and then in the data file, we can give another value if we need. Objective function, we need to write minimize or maximize. Depends. Then we give a name. We can invent the name we want to the function. Then this, and then we write the function. So in this case, is three because a equal three. 3x1 minus 2x2. This is the function we want to minimize. And then we can specify the constraints. So to specify a constraint, you need to use the keyword subject to name of the constraint, followed by this, followed by the constraint. So what is this problem now? Here we are saying, hey, we have two variables that are non-negative. We know that the sum of these two variables is equal to four. I want to find the values of x1 and x2, then minimize the function 3x1 minus 2x2. This is what the model is doing. Now, if I ask you to do that, you may take a piece of paper and try, it, and maybe you can find a solution. But imagine when you have 100 or 1,000 of variables. You cannot do that. But with this, we can. Um, okay, here is the data file. As I say, we can assign different values. Before we define a, a default value of three, if we want to upload a new value in the data file, we can use this param, uh, name of the parameter, and then the new value like that. But is optional, as I say. Then let's look at the run file. So in the run file, we need to tell the solver a few, the ample a few things. Number one, what is the model? So we need to write the keyword model followed by the name of the model. If we have the data, we also need to say data uh, name of the model like dot dat. If we have a data file, but is optional. Then we need to tell the solver what is, sorry, the ample, what is the solver? What do we want to use to solve the problem? In this case, we use simplex. Okay. 
we tell now Ample to solve the problem. So use Cplex to find the optimal solution and then show me the solution. So the value of X1 and X2. Okay, so far? I mean, I know, I know it's a lot of things and maybe the first time you see may seem a little complex, but you will see that after you, you try a couple of times, it's pretty straightforward. So to summarize, each variable use the var keyword. Objective function is a statement that begins with minimize or maximize. And then we have the name of the, the objective. And then we have the expression. Uh, the constraint use the subject to keyword. Uh, multiplication, important, you need to use the star operator. So if you, if you write 3x1, Ample will not understand. You have to write 3 times x1. Okay, this is written like that, greater than or equal to, you have to write greater and followed by equal and the same for less than or equal to. Uh, here we are using simplex, but other solvers are available and display is the basic command to show the value of some variables. Now, remember this was the, the way we wrote the linear programming. This is the problem we just defined, okay? So uh, what I want you to focus on is that the vector C here is this three minus two, is the, the example I made earlier. And then if we look at the, very, the matrix A, actually we don't have a matrix because it's a single constraint, but this is the coefficient one, one of this, right? And then this B is four. So I just want you to show that the problem we define is written in the form that we explained earlier. So is a linear program. And then how you may, you may be wondering how, how does this look like? So we need to take uh, create the mod file. And by the way, all these mod data run files are just simple text files. You can use any text editor, okay? Uh, when you see this, by the way, is a comment. So here, what we are saying is this. Um, we can write the model like this, but as I say, we can separate data from the model, right? So let's try to write the model in this form here. So we define a parameter n. n is how many variables? In this case, is two. This is another interesting construct in Ample, the set. So this thing here means that n is equal all the number one up to n. So it will be one and two. If n was 100, it will be one, two, three, four, up to 100. So it's a very nice way to save us the time to write all of them if n is very big. And then we need to index C, A, right? Remember this? We say that C will be this and A will be this. And because they have dimension two, they are vector with two elements, right? This way to write means that we have a C1 and a C2 and uh, A1 and A2. Because they are defined over the set N, and N is the number one, two. Same for the variable. So why we do that? Because instead of writing C1, C2, or imagine C1, C2, C3, C4, and so on, with this way, we can, we can just write C, N, and this is create immediately C1, C2, C3, C, whatever it is. So variable, we also have two variables, x1 and x2. So we define like that. Now the objective function, remember here, it was 3x1 minus 2x2. So it was basically c1x1 plus c2x2. We can write this way. Sum for every j in n, that is 1, 2, of cj, xj. This means c1 x1 plus c2 x2. So this is the compact way to write with Ample, but don't worry. I mean, 
you will not be asked to go through these and write models like that. It's just for you to have a first example of what we can do with Temple. And the constraint, similarly, right, it was uh, x1 plus x2. We know that a was 1, 1. This is x is uh, x1, x2. So if we want to write x1 plus x2 equal to 4, we can use the same the same way. So b is equal to 4. And this means a1x1 plus a2, sorry, um, 1 times x1 plus 2 times x2, because a is 1, 1. So this is what we just uh, saw. Uh, we have the sets, the parameter, the variables. Parameter is data, remember. Um, what is important here is that if we have to write the C1x1, for example, this is how we write it. Remember always this when you have a multiplication. And C1 will be in ample C1. We need to use the square bracket. And then you cannot use keywords like sum or in as name of variables and other things. Otherwise, Ample will not understand if we are referring to a keyword or, or, or something else. Data file, remember here we have to define C, B, A. N and M is how many variables I'm constrained. This I think is pretty easy, N equal to two, M equal to one. This means what? This means that C1 is equal to 3 and C2 is equal to minus 2. So this is the way we write in M. Here you write the index and here you write the values. So when we have a parameter that is a, it's not just a single number, then this is the way we write. But don't worry, all these will be available in the slides and, and it's just for you to know the syntax, in case you need to refer later for, I don't know, maybe you're really interested in Ample and you want to have a reference, then you can use this. But it's not the main point here. The main point is to start to understand the logic behind it. Um, we say that uh, one of the reasons why we want to separate model and data is because we can write the model once and change the data, so we don't need to touch the model anymore. When we have specific data, the model becomes what is called an instance, right? And, and then we can solve an instance of the problem, and, and then we have the optimal solution. Finally, the run file. In the run file, we have to say the model we use is this. The data we use is this. We want to use CPLEX, solve the problem, show me X. Now, if we run this, this run file. Here you see the output you get. So in if you are using a Mac, usually the way you write is like that. Ample is the name of the software. This symbol, example.run. If you are under Windows, you may need to double click the Ample application that you download and then type include and the name of the run file and then you enter. So Windows is slightly different. But the outcome that you get is the same. The solver, you see CPLEX is telling you, I found the optimal solution of your problem. The objective function is minus eight. And this is the best, like this is the solution. X1 equals zero, X2 equals four. What does it mean? If we take this problem, The values that minimize this expression and that respect this constraint are x1, 0, x2, 4, and the objective function value is minus 8. And you can be sure that you cannot find better. If the solver tells you optimal solution, it means you cannot find minus 9 with another combination. That is the best. You may find another one that gives you the same value, but you cannot find a better value. And as you see, we didn't have to go through the procedure. Okay, how do we need, what do we need to, to do uh, to find a solution? No, we just wrote the model. 
the data, the run file, and then this guy, Cplex, took charge of finding the optimal solution. So this is more or less the procedure in this uh, in this course. We focus on modeling, not on solving. Solving, there is some other software like Cplex. And then you can express very complex problems. Like here, you have seen an example with two variables. Imagine you have problems with hundreds of variables, thousands of constraints, and Cplex can solve them pretty quickly. OK. Um, Helen, at what time are you are you having the polls usually? Just to know. We well, usually at uh, eleven past, so in in eight okay. minutes. Then maybe I can. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I can introduce a problem now because you have seen the the basic. So let's take an example. So the example is, I mean, if if you have a background in finance, sorry, I know it's a very stupid problem. It's a very simple problem, but it's just something for us to, to get used to, to amp. So imagine there are two funds, X and Y. And these two funds, they have a return. We know that fund X gave us 4.5% and fund Y, 5% a year. And we have $50,000 capital. What we need to do is this, writing an optimization problem with Ample and solve it with Cplex to find the allocation of the capital to the funds that maximize the profit of the portfolio. Okay, now you may be telling me, well, this is a stupid problem, right? I put all my money in fund Y, I get more, and you're right. But just for the sake of modeling, let's see how we model this problem. So let's start from the data. Remember, there are uh, four components, parameters, that is data, objective, constraints, and variables. We need to know all of them. So what are the data here? We know the return of the fund X, we know the return of the fund Y, and we know the capital. These are the numbers of the problem, right? This is the data we are working with. Then, what is the objective? We want to maximize the profit of the portfolio. That is a total return. We know that. Next, what are the variables? Well, if we want to invest the capital, we need to know how much we are allocating to fund X and how much to fund Y. So these are the variables of our problem. And finally, what is the, the, the only constraint here is that the total amount of money is 50K. Right, we are not using leverage here. It's a very simple problem. We just have 50K cash account. We can only invest that, and we want to invest all of it. How do we write the mod data and maybe data if we want a run file to solve this? Well, this is the mod file. We need to define, remember the parameters. I call Rx the return of fund X. RY is the return of fund Y, and capital is the capital. See that I use the keywords param because they are parameters. They are numbers that we know before solving the problem, while variables are numbers that we know only after solving the problem. Variables are X and Y, basically the allocation to the fund X and Y, and they are non-negative. We are not short selling. We want to maximize the objective function. So what is the objective function? Well, is the total return. So is the return, I wrote over 100 because here I wrote 5% as 5. If I wrote 0 0.05, I don't need to divide by 100. But basically, is the return of X, uh, fund X times the amount of money we put in X plus the return of fund Y times the amount of money we put in Y. The constraint subject to, we call this constraint allocation, and we say that x plus y is equal to capital. Do you agree with this model? Does it make sense? OK. Now, what happens if 
uh, well, in this case, we have the data file. So we have uh, the Rx is the return of fund X is 4.5. Ry is five and capital is 50,000. So this is the data file and the run file, we say the model is fans.mod. So the previous uh, files, the model, I call it fans.mod and the data fans.dat. So data fans.dat, we say that we need to use Cplex. Solve the problem and show me X and Y. So I guess you know what to expect. And when we solve the problem, yes, we see what we expected. We don't put anything on the fund giving 4.5%. We put everything on the other fund. And the objective that is the return is 2,500. So it's 5%. So this is what we expected. It, it, it means it's working as it should. Okay. Um, at this point, I want to give you this. Uh, well, this we have done already, the interpretation of the solution. As I said, it was not a very interesting problem, but just to understand the logic. But then I have a scenario for you. Then maybe during the pause, you can think about that. Imagine you want to modify this problem and you have an additional constraint. So now you cannot invest in fund Y more than twice of what is invested in fund X. What is the return? So what I would like you to do is to think at how you would write this constraint. Okay. Then we put the constraint inside the model. We solve it again and we will see what is the solution at that point. Okay. Yeah, so I think it's more or less time, right? Yeah, so I, I will leave you with this um, problem for now. And then when we come back, we can discuss the solution. Okay? Sounds good. Let's make the break. So let's be back at quarter past. See yeah. You See you soon. Okay, so any idea on the way to write a constraint? I think I would add a second constraint that I should be smaller than 2x. Okay, smaller or smaller than or equal to? As smaller than or equal to. Mm. Yeah. So basically that's the, the constraint you see here is exactly the same model. And then I call that fun split. So now we have uh, this one. So yeah, it's right. Now, what is the solution that you would expect this way? I mean, the fun Y is still the best, right? I mean, I will yeah, show so, you. Yeah, go, go ahead. Well, uh, I think Y would then be one third and X two thirds. Okay, let's see if you're right. The mod, the data file is the same. The run file is the same. And this is the solution. Oh, wait, there is a message in the chat. Okay, we will get the equality. What do we mean? Oh, yeah, the equality, yes. Uh, basically, it's true that at the optimal solution, this will be an equality constraint. And Yes. So there is something that I want you to notice here. So it's true that the funds are allocated one third and two thirds. 
right? So it's one third to X and two third to Y. And because Y is the best and there is something else here also. Look at the objective function value. You remember the value before? Uh, let me go to the, uh, where is it? This one, remember here, the objective function was 2,500, right? The new problem we solve is 2416 point something. Do you think it's a coincidence that the objective function is lower? Regardless of what was the constraint. Do you think it could have been more than 25? 2,500. I, uh, I don't think so. Yeah, so oh, I said I think, no. I think Lucas was also speaking, but I didn't hear what I cannot hear. Sorry. Yeah, now I can hear you. Perfect. So I think that's kind of the logic of a constraint, right? Mm -hmm. If the constraint is working and is cutting off part of the solution, it could reduce the result, but it can't increase it. Yeah, exactly. So uh, I don't know if uh, this is also what uh, Nicolin wanted to say, but if you remember, I, I, a very easy way to understand is the picture we had before, right? So this is the feasible region. Now, what can happen is if we have a new constraint, best case, it will not affect the region. So the solution stays the same. But if it's affecting the region, we can potentially be cutting something. So if we reduce the feasible region, we cannot improve the solution. We can only make it worse or keep the same. So yeah, regardless of the kind of constraint here, we could not expect to have more than 2,500. 2,500 or less. Okay, so this was just a small example for you to, to understand some of the concepts, like how to write the model, um, a few things like the meaning of the feasible region and how constraints can affect the feasibility. Um, speaking of, do you think if we have this problem here with 2,500 and now suddenly we say that, um, I mean, maybe not this one, but let's take this one. If now we say that X and Y are integer, do you think the solution will be better or worse or what? See, basically, that these and these are integer. Well, oh, sorry, Nicolin. So, yeah. Okay. Uh, if it's just another constraint, right? Mm -hmm. At some point, so it can't be better. Yes. So, is another constraint is true. Actually, we write integer, um, but this is also, there is a way to write it as a nonlinear constraint, uh, like something like, um, um, I think it should be zero, something like that, uh, is another way to write that X is integer. But the main, the other um, thing that may happen, what you say is right, is right 
is that this one, if we have integer, may not hold with equality. That's the other thing you may notice when you have integer solution that some of the constraints that are um, satisfied that equality may not be with integrality. Yeah. Okay. So let's move to the last part of the top of the lecture today: the max flow problem. Uh, have you heard about this? Do you know what it is? For first time, no. Okay. This is a very classical problem in optimization, and the problem is to send from a source to a terminal something. It can be any goods. Imagine it can be oil, it can be um, water, it can be whatever. So you have a source, you have a terminal, and then you have a network of, uh, imagine network of pipes that are connected. And you want to send as much as possible from the source to the terminal using this network. And each component of the network is associated with a capacity. So maybe one pipe, you can only send three units, another pipe, five, and and, and this is more or less the setting. I will show you in the next slides uh, a picture to better understand. And this kind of problem can find a lot of applications in infrastructure system like transportation. So this is a way to represent the network. In this case, imagine that this is um, the source. So you see, we have some nodes and some links. Actually, they are called arcs because they have an orientation. So we have one of these nodes that is called source and another one is called terminal. Okay, and imagine from the source, you can send whatever you want. Um, Every arc has a capacity. Let's say that every arc, we can only send 10 units, no more than 10 units of stuff, whatever you want. Let's say oil. So here you can say you can send 10 units or less. And what happened at every node? At every node, the amount of goods that enter must be equal to the one that go out. So if there are, let's say, five units coming in, to node four, imagine that we are sending five, then the total amount that is flowing out from four must be equal to five. Maybe three, one, one, I don't know. Why? Because we are assuming that nothing is created and destroyed. The flow that is going out from node six must enter node seven. Every time the flow reach a node, Whatever enter that node must be equal to what is going out from that node, except for the terminal and the source, of course, where source you only have flow out and the terminal flow in. So to recap, we have a network, we have a, ter a source and a terminal node. We are sending from source to terminal through the network. Each arc is associated with a capacity, the maximum amount of goods that we can send and every node, we have a, what is called flow conservation constraint. That means whatever is going in must go out. This is the setting of the max flow problem. What is the objective? Choose how much to send to each arc so that we maximize the amount of flow that enter here. That is equal to the amount of flow that exit here. So this is the problem. Uh, it... One question. Um, yeah. Do we want to maximize the flow in the whole network or we can use it to concentrate maybe on specific like points, like number one or two, we... maybe depending on when, when we want to, if we have a city and we have the flow of water, maybe there are yes. more populated areas, so we want to increase the flow there. In this case, we are maximizing the flow that is coming out from this, the total flow that is going out. And by construction is equal to the total flow that is coming in here. But you can have a variation where, for example, you can say, look, I want to maximize the total flow that is entering here. I don't know. It's also possible. Okay. okay. It's Thank just you. the classical ways that we have the source and the terminal and we want to maximize the flow reaching terminal from the source and we don't really care what is happening in the other part of the network but it can be like the funds allocation 
maybe it can be additional constraints, you know. Maybe if it's water, you may say, look, uh, in this area, maybe this is a part of the city, I want to have a flow, uh, flow in two of at least 10 units, right? You can add more constraints according to what you are modeling. Yes, okay, thank you. You're welcome. So how do we create in Ample this model, the model representing the Marx flow? We follow the same procedure. Remember, we have to define the constraint objective function parameter and variables. And when we are using Ample, as I said with the set N before, we don't want to write, um, for example, a variable for a specifically write every single arc. We use sets, right? So remember the set N was the numbers one to N. In this way, we can represent the elements of the network as well. So for example, we can define a set V is the set of vertices of the network where S and T are the source and the terminal. So these are all the nodes that you have seen before. And then we have the set A of arcs of the network. They are pair of vertices. Because uh, an arc like this arc, going from four to seven, we can represent it like that, four, seven. So it's a pair of nodes, the starting and the ending one. Then we have a variable f. f is a variable that represents the flow on each arc. So remember before when we defined the variables for each element of n, like n was 1, 2, and then we have x1, x2. Here we have f for each arc. So similarly, we define f for each arc with this notation. It means we have a variable f for every element of a, so for every arc. For every arc, we need to know what is the flow. Let's look at the parameters then. We have a capacity defined again for each arc that is the maximum quantity of flow through the arc. Then we have the parameter n, number of vertices. S and T are the source and the terminal. What is the objective is to maximize the total flow. So we have two ways to, to, to define that. It's either, as I say, the flow that is going out from the source or the flow that is coming in the terminal. In this way, we define the flow that is going out from the source. So remember, F is the variable representing the flow, is associated with each arc, and each arc is defined by the starting and ending node. So what is the flow going out from the source is basically any flow where the starting point is the node S and the ending point is any, any node for which S, J is an arc. So the way to write that is this. We sum for each arc having form S, J. So every arc where the first node is the source and the second one is any other, we sum the flow. What we are doing basically, we are saying if this is F, S, Four, this is F S three, and this is F S nine. The objective function is this plus this plus this, and we want to maximize that because this is the same as the flow that goes in. Okay, so the objective is to maximize that. Um, what else? with constraints. Well, the first one is that we cannot send through an arc more than the capacity. If we can send 10 units, because that's a capacity, the variable f cannot be 11 or 12. So the flow is less than or equal to the capacity. And then this is the flow conservation constraint that I mentioned earlier. So whatever is going in a node, must be equal to what is going out, except for the source and the terminal. Why? Because nothing is coming inside the source and nothing is going out from the terminal. So how to write that? 
subject to is a constraint, name. This means we have a constraint for each for each node. This means except the source and the terminal. So this way we can write one constraint, but then this will be repeated for each node that is not source or terminal. And what we are saying here is that the flow that is I is the node we are looking at. This is the flow that is going out from I to some other node J, right? The sum of all this flow is equal to the flow that from node K is going side I. In other words, what is entering node I is equal to what is going out from node I. This is the flow conservation. So with this constraint, we make sure that we are not exceeding the, uh, <clears throat> the flow that we can send through each arc and that we are not losing or creating flow from nothing. So how do we write the mode? Well, we have a parameter n, s, t, as we say. The set of vertices, we can index them from 1 to n. Uh, n is the number of nodes, so as before. Uh, this within VV means that arcs are um, pairs of nodes, a subset of all the pairs of nodes. This within is another keyword. Okay, but for now, don't worry. It's just a, um, a term that we need to use to have a valid definition. Then we have the capacity for each arc. Let's say in this problem that all the capacities are set to 10 to make it easier. We have the variable flow for each arc greater than or equal to zero. We want to maximize the total flow that is the flow going outside S. And the two constraints, the capacity cannot, sorry, the flow cannot exceed the capacity and the, the flow entering node I is equal to the flow going out from node I. This is the mode file of the max flow. Any question? Okay. What is the data file that represents the picture you have seen before? So if you remember, here we have nine nodes. The source is node six and the terminal is node seven. So we define n is the number of node nine, source is six and terminal is seven. And the set A is the set of pair of arcs. So all these entries, basically they are the starting and ending node of each arc. So we have one, two, two, three, two, eight. And if you look at them, they are these. So we have one, two, two, three, two, eight. And you can count, they are all of them. So the data file represents the structure of this network. The nodes, the source, the terminal, and at the same time, the, um, the links. Now, run file, same thing. The model is the maxflow.mod. The data is the maxflow.dat. Option solver CPLEX, we use CPLEX as a solver. We solve the problem, we want to show the flow. For each arc, we want to know the value of the flow. And then we use it, as I say, this is the way we run it with uh, a, a Mac on the terminal. But if you have Windows, remember you double click on Ample and then you write include the name of this guy and then you click enter and it should work. What is the output? This is the output that we get. Cplex say optimal solution, objective 30. So the flow, the max flow that we can send is 30, 30 units. And it's also telling us where the flow appears. So is in these, 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 and these arcs. All the others we are sending zero units. And we are sending 10 in this. 
if we want to see that, this is what is going on. So the arcs that are not highlighted means we are sending zero. And those in black, we are sending 10. So you see what is going on. We are sending 10 units here, and they are going here, right? So I get 10. Then I'm sending 10 here, and they go here. And then I have another 10. And then the last 10 here, then they go here. And then we have 10. So we send 30 and we get 30. And this is the max flow. What does it mean? There is no way you can send 40 units. You can find all the combination you want. You can try to send some other way, maybe from here to here and then here, and then here, and maybe you think, but if it's an optimal solution, it means that 30 is the, is the best you can. Doesn't mean there is no other alternative way, because for example, if instead of sending here, you send these 10 units through this and this and this, you still get 30. It's a different solution, but it's still 30, yes? Yeah, so um, is it then, are the solutions consistent? Like if there is multiple options for the maximum, would it always keep the same? Or I don't know if it matters, like how does it- It, it, it does, it does. Actually, uh, a few things. In terms of objective function value is always 30, is always the same. But the different, the what can change is the X, the variable values. Now, these solutions where you may have multiple solutions giving you the same objective function value, they are called symmetric solution. Usually solvers like CPLEX or when you solve this problem, they only find one. It doesn't mean that there is not another solution that can give you the same. There are some settings where CPLEX can give you more, but actually if you want to find uh, alternative solution, you may need to impose some constraints to force somehow the problem to be solved in a different way. Um, in some cases, having a lot of different solutions may be a problem because it may make the problem harder to solve for reasons that I, I don't think are really the, the key focus here. But the, the fact that you have potentially many symmetric solutions may mean that you need more time to find one. Or sometimes in other setting, it may be faster because you have many, so it really depends. But coming to your question, yes, it's possible that we have different solutions. What is um, What remains is the objective function value. Regardless of the solution, the objective function is always 30. This is um, usually, even more likely when we have problems, like imagine you have a huge network with maybe thousands of arcs. It's very unlikely that one solution is the best and there is nothing else that can give you the same because you may have alternative path. And this will be important in the next lecture when we are looking at how to protect against disruptions, where imagine that someone can destroy a link and then you can find an alternative way to send the goods. But this is more or less the, uh, the max flow. Yes? My question is that the solution you show here looks mm. like it's um, the, the fastest in a way. It goes through the least number of nodes. Uh, so could that be entered as a constraint? Like I, I want to imagine that traveling from one node to the other takes some time. What you show here seems to be like the fastest way of sending 30 from 6 to 7. Like if you want, for example, to find the shortest, right? What you could do is, now I know that the objective function is 30, right? The, the, the best is 30. Oh, sorry. So imagine that um, the objective that we wanted to maximize is 30. 
Now I can do something else. I can impose this as a constraint. And I can say for each arc, put a cost one. And then I may need to minimize the sum of F A. So what is the meaning of that? Actually, no, no, I cannot do it like that if I say that the objective is 30. Imagine we have another variable x. x means I choose or not the arc, right? So what I want to do is I want to, um, well, actually, there is, yeah, we, maybe we don't need x. I can do this. I can uh, minimize the sum of the flow with the constraints the the um, the objective so the total flow here is 30. so what is the meaning now every time there is a flow that we choose this is equal to 10 right now the difference between this solution is now i have six arcs equal to 10 and the objective is 30. if i have um this solution here right i still have 30 as objective, but if I count the sum of these, it will be one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, 80. Because I'm taking eight arcs, right? So basically, if I do these, I'm saying I want to find a solution at least as good as the one that I found before, but I want to minimize how many arcs I'm touching. So this way you may be able to find an alternative solution or actually the solution that costs the lowest amount. Or if you want to put a max, you find the, the one that is touching as many links as possible. So this is another way to play with this. First, you solve the original problem. You take the objective function equal to the optimal value and you put that as a constraint. And then you use another objective to do what you want, like finding the longest path, finding the one where you are spreading to as many arcs as possible and so on. So this is another approach that you can follow to basically um, identify out of the solutions that are symmetric, those that you are really interested into. Mm, super, thank you. Any other? Question? OK, then I think we can go to the summary. First thing I think you learn a lot today, you may not realize, but is a lot of things like what is uh, optimization problem? What are uh, mathematical programming problem? How they can be modeled? The basic of amples and how to solve problem with CPLEX, and then also the max flow, and how we can model and solve it with, with Ample. So there's a lot of things in less than two hours. What will be uh, what we will be doing in the next lecture? We want to look at the max flow. We start again from the max flow, and we want to see what happens when some of the arcs of the network can be destroyed. Imagine like uh, an attack or any other kind of failure. And we want to ask ourselves, is it possible to derive the worst case disruption without checking all of them? So what is the disruption that will minimize the max flow without having to try all the disruptions? And when we identify that, the next question is, what is the best way to fortify the system to improve the resilience in the worst case? That means knowing that some arcs can be destroyed, can we make some of them indestructible in such a way that the resulting disruption is as good as possible? So in other words, we are looking at a game. This is related to game theory, defender, attacker, defender problems, if you heard about them, where we have two players. One is trying to minimize the function and the other one to maximize, and they are playing one against each other. So we need to identify the best strategy for protecting a system, knowing that after we protect, the bad guy will destroy the system. And after this destruction, we have to maximize the 
max true. So it's a three level, you see it's the defender, attacker, and then max flow. And the good news is that we don't need to check all the possible combinations. It will be crazy. There are ways to find a solution that are smarter. And this is the topic of the next lecture. Um, in the meantime, please download Ample and Cplex from this website. Uh, you can choose the community edition license. It should work for the size of the problem we are dealing with. Uh, you can run, I think you should have this example.run. You can just run and see if it's working. Remember, if it's on Ample, you can go through the, the slides here. Uh, the command is the name, like something like that. You write Ample from the terminal, low like this, and then the name like example, dot run if you are on windows double click on the ample and write include example dot run uh, all the files ample cplex and also the run and everything must be in the same folder it's very important any problem you can write me and uh, ideally, you should have this running for before the next lecture, because at that point, you may have some uh, um, activity, like interactive activity to do during the lecture. It will not be like this one where you listen only. It will be one where you also need to write some code to try and see what happens. Uh, that's all from my side. Uh, I will take these uh, last minutes just to answer to any questions you may have. I have a question about this, the Ample installation. Yes. Um, I'm a bit confused if I, I installed like the demo version, but that's not the community edition. Okay. Um, the demo so, should also work. Okay. Yeah, it did work with that test thing. Then, then it's fine. Uh, because they, they recently changed the license for Ample. Before it was demo or paid. Now they have this community as well. Uh, but if the demo is working, uh, I think should be okay. Thank you. Okay. Any other question? All good. Looks like it's clear. Seems all good. Okay, so as I said, uh, try to make it run by next time and then let me know. Um, I'm always uh, available through mail. If you have a problem, we can have a Zoom call as well to see together if something is not working, why. Um, yes, and well, thank you for joining and I hope you enjoy. I think that learning some basic of optimization can be useful for you regardless of this course for many other purposes, because optimization can be used to solve any kind of problem. So I think it's good to get the basics here, and I hope that it will be useful for you as well. Thank you. Thank okay. you, and I guess see you day, next everybody. time. See you next yeah, thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.